All right, well, hello everybody and thank you for joining me today. Before I start my presentation, I wanted to talk a little bit about why I suggested this, which I call Definitively France. And we're going to take a whirlwind tour through um, definitive issues of the late 19th and first half of the 20th century. So I've always been uh, interested in the definitive series. I think it's really neat when you have a lot of stamps with similar design, but lots of different colors. And over time, there are a lot of varieties and variations, things to study. And um, as Paul was just talking about, I cut my teeth on the holy grail of definitive series, the Machen series. So in comparison, these French series are much simpler. And as to the dates, well, as we'll see, 1876 was the introduction of a uh, unified design series. And the stamps before that were the so-called classic stamps of France, which is just a whole different uh, aspect and, and way of studying. So they're not included. And we started in 1876. And 1940, of course, was the beginning of World War II on French soil. And that was just a logical place to stop. So let's talk about 1876. Why was there a new design in 1876? A number of reasons. First of all, France was recovering from the disastrous Franco-Prussian War, which ended in 1871, followed by what was effectively a civil war called the Paris Commune. But by the mid 1870s, that was all bygone and France was flourishing. And so there was some desire for some new stamps. Also the Third Republic, which had been established in 1871 was pretty stable and seemed to be long lasting in comparison to the First Republic, which was initiated in the French Revolution but was supplanted by the first empire, only Napoleon, by under Napoleon I. And then the Second Republic, which was established by the revolution of 1848, only to be supplanted by the second empire, Napoleon III, about two years later. The third reason was a practical one. The earlier French stamps had been printed by a private printer named Anatole Hulot, and he was apparently not an easy person to get along with. And the government thought his prices were a little high. So here was a chance for them to end his contracts and start printing stamps at a government controlled facility. And finally, and perhaps the most important one is France entered the General Postal Union effective January 1st, 1876. The earlier French stamps had really tiny uh, numerals in the corners, and they wanted to have something that was a little easier to see, which indeed the 1876 issue was. And also they wanted a more modern design for the times. So all those things kind of came together. And what we now call the peace and commerce issue was introduced in 1876. It was designed by Jules Auguste Sage and his design he called Peace and Commerce, Unite and Rule the World. And as you see, there are two representatives um, of peace on the left, a woman holding an olive branch and commerce, uh, Mercury on the right, um, united and with the globe underneath them. So the stamp on the left is one of the ones issued for use domestically within France. Um, in the beginning of the series life, uh, starting in 1877 for a few years, the stamps were distributed to French colonies for use, but those were not perforated. Uh, and there was no marking on them or indication of them as to where they were used unless you can identify that cancel on a used copy. So if you see um, imperfect varieties of the Sage series, then it is most likely one that was used in the colonies and not in error. 
And finally, the uh, late in the series life in the late 1880s and the following decade, the design was used for French colonies and overseas post offices, um, but these were overprinted and if necessary surcharged so you can identify them and these were perforated. And I forgot to mention, as I noted that um, these stamps are often referred to by collectors as typesage and that kind of moniker was used for a number of different series from this period as we'll talk about in a few minutes. One of the things you will notice about the series, if you have a pre-printed album or you look at the Scott listings, is that there are two die types for the series. <laughs> now that is not unusual, but what is a little unusual is type one was the first one introduced. It was <clears throat> supplanted by type two. And then towards the end of its life, type one reappeared. That is a little bit unusual. And um, so let me explain, excuse me here. Um, let me explain why there were two types and what caused this reversion to type one. But excuse me for a second. So this is a complicated story and I will try to tell it without getting my tongue all twisted up. So the stamp was designed by Sage and it was engraved by uh, Louis um, Eugene Mouchon, who was a, an accomplished engraver at the time. Now this uh, stamp, this series of stamps and most French stamps in this era were printed by surface printing or typography. So while there was an engraved die, it's a different style of engraving than is used for recess printing. But I don't wanna get into the difference of printing types here. So just remember that it is an engraved die. And one of the substrates that is used for these engraved dies is soft steel. And so he engraved the design into a die. One aspect of this design is that in the frame in the lower left corner is the name of the designer. Um, as you can see in these illustrations, J.A. Sage, followed by INV, which stands for the French word inventa, which in this sense means designer. And um, Mouchon's name as the engraver appears on the lower right hand corner, which I didn't show, it's not relevant to this discussion. So when Mouchon engraved that, the spacing of the letters just happened to be in the arrangement that you see at the bottom where the N of INV appears under the U of République. Now, typically the process of going from the engraved die to a printing plate is that the soft steel die would be hardened in a heating process and then used further. But Mouchon, I guess from some practical experience had some doubts about this process. And so he um, arranged for some copies of his die to be made before the, um, the hardening. Now this was a normal procedure because the way that he did his master die is in the um, central block where you see a denomination, he left that blank. That would be a master die. And then copies would be made to be secondary dies. And each of those secondary dies would have an individual denomination in it. So his master die didn't have a denomination in it. So he had a few copies made of this master die and then he submitted his die for hardening. And as he foresaw, the die was damaged. And the, most of the damage was done in the lower left corner where Saj's name well, was. And so Mouchon was able to repair this die and create a new die, 
But when he was doing it, the spacing of Saj's name was different. And the, for reference purposes, we talk about the N being under the B this time, rather than under the U. And this die was the one that was used for the first stamps of this series in 1876. So as philatelists, we call this type one because it was the first one issued, even though it was the second die created by Mouchon. But after the stamps were issued, Mouchon decided that he really still didn't like that second die. There were other, there was other damage to the original die, which did not get repaired and he didn't like the design. So he convinced the Ministry of Posts to go back and use those copies of his first design to create new secondary dies and start issuing stamps later in 1876 with this, what was original, his original die, copies of his this original die. Recorded. And uh, he, uh, and so this design became called type two, even though it was his first die. So type two was then used for all. Oh, Paul, can, can you meet everybody? Okay, thank you. Um, so all the subsequent new denominations that appeared after this were type two, but stamps that were originally issued as type one remained as type one as long as those printing plates and dies were still available. So you had new type twos and old type ones that continued. Uh, eventually though, as we got into the 1890s, some of these type two dies and their printing plates started getting worn out. But as we'll see, there were already plans for replacing the Saj series with new stamps. So they didn't want to go to the effort of creating more new type two dies. So they went back to type one dies, which there still were some good ones of, and a few uh, new denominations issued in the last few years of the Saj series were type one. So that's why we have this progression of type two, I'm sorry, type one, type two, and type one again. So I made a chart based on the Scott listings of value color combinations that exist in both type one and type two formats. So there are eight of those that were originally type one and were replaced with type twos. And there are two of those that were originally type two and then in the last couple of years were replaced with type one. So you can use this as a guide for which stamps do I need to look at carefully and which ones do I not. And the reason you'd want to do this is because the Scott values are different for type one and type two, in some cases, very different, especially for unused copies. So it does make a difference if you have type one or type two. I want to show a couple of pieces of postal stationery from this period that I think are interesting. The first is a reply letter card. So the normal letter card without the reply is a single sheet of paper. So somewhat similar to a card but it can be folded in half and sealed. So the message is private, somewhat like a letter. So we call it a letter card. And typically this is just one sheet of paper and you fold it and seal it. And then the recipient tears it open on the perforation and reads it. But a reply card needed to have a second card so that the recipient can reply. And that was done by having a smaller letter card inside uh, or that could be folded inside the original outer letter card. And so what you see there in the center is how it looks when the purchaser of the reply card first opens it up 
and sees the response card. The response card can then be folded down and the sender can write the message on the whole part of the letter card, then refold that reply card to seal the whole thing. And the recipient, of course, gets that, opens the perforations, can separate the reply card and send that back. And the way this looks unfolded is shown on the right-hand side with the two that are um, really one sheet of paper that can be torn apart. Another interesting item of stationery is also based on the letter card. And this was uh, the ability for an entrepreneur to buy the letter cards from the post office and then solicit advertisements that were printed on the inside of the letter card and also on a trifold piece of paper that was then stitched into the letter card. And so the entrepreneur, of course, gets money for this advertisement or these advertisements, and then can afford to have these sold at tobacco shops for a vastly reduced price. And so the buyer was able to buy these for five centime instead of the 15 centime that the um, would have cost buying the plain copy from the post office. So this was uh, apparently a good deal all around. The entrepreneur made some money and the postal patrons got to um, buy these letter cards for much less than they would cost otherwise. Um, you can see there on the right that Trifold has some advertising in it. And then when you open it up, it has space for the message because the inside of the letter card itself is covered with advertisements. Of interest is the text around the margin, which says, do not remove the ad pages under penalty of prosecution. But if the buyer does remove that center uh, edition of the ad page, uh, he or she has nowhere to write the message. So it doesn't make any sense that the buyer would remove that. Uh, but nonetheless, I thought it was interesting that they felt it necessary to inscribe that. So as you see here, these were authorized in 1887, but I do not know um, how long they lasted, whether they were subsequently deauthorized or not. One thing I want to do during this presentation is um, talk about commemorations of these designs that were issued later by the French Post Office. <clears throat> so the Sage design was commemorated for its centenary with the issuance of a single stamp on stamp design, which is shown here on the left, um, canceled on a maximum card. In 2016, a complete booklet of 14 stamps was issued, primarily aimed at collectors, and it had two basic designs on it. The red stamps that you see there are basically copies of the issued Saj design with the denomination change to the current rate in euros so that the stamps could actually be used. They would be valid postage stamps. And actually, these red stamps came in two varieties, type one and type two, um, just to be complete in terms of um, reprinting them. Of a little more interest are the stamps in black, which show Saj's original design. And you can see that his design that he submitted <clears throat> was actually had the globe and the denomination just um, printed over the globe itself, and probably Michonne, in combination with the ministry, decided to change that and carve out a block so that they could use the process I determined earlier of making secondary dies and then simply engrave the denomination in that otherwise blank space. <clears throat> the cover of that booklet has a number of interesting things. So the cover is shown there. And on the left-hand side of the cover, 
the, the back of the cover, the way I've shown it there, is an image of Mushon's first die after it cracked. And so I've enlarged that there. And you can see that the damage was extensive in the lower left-hand corner, right where the designer's name would be. And there was also some damage to the upper, I'm sorry, the lower left-hand corner and some damage to the upper left-hand corner. And I think a few spots of damage elsewhere may be visible. <clears throat> then on the cover, there's also some images from that die and then a picture of Mushon's second die, which you can't really see too much of. But it's interesting for collectors to see this bit of history that um, the French post office uh, issued in 2016. <clears throat> so the size issue was introduced in 1876. About 20 years later, they began to get tired of it and thinking about a new issue. And it was determined that 1900 would be a good year for that. First of all, France was hosting both a World's Fair and the Summer Olympic Games, and that would be a good time to have some new stamps. France was in a period of prosperity that we call La Belle Epoque, the beautiful era. <clears throat> and also it would be a new century. So that would be good timing. And finally, there was some pressure to have stamps that actually had a representation of France. Um, and the underlying sentiment was to show its contrast with the representation of Germany, Germania, who was appearing on German stamps at the time. <clears throat> so what happened is in 1894, the post office or the Ministry of Posts had a design contest that was a total failure. None of the designs were considered to be acceptable. So a couple of years later, they simply assigned designs to three different artists. Uh -huh. One each for low, middle, and high values. Uh, is everybody muted? Okay. <clears throat> so the three artists were Paul Joseph Blanc, Louis Eugene Mouchon. So besides an engraver, he was also an artist. And so he had the opportunity to design a stamp. And then Luke. Where would I look to? Son. Sorry. <clears throat> so although this was planned for the 1900 World's Fair, Blanc was late with his design and the post office decided they wanted to issue all three designs at the same time. So the whole set of stamps was held up until December 4th, which unfortunately was after the World's Fair closed and certainly was after the end of the Olympics. So we'll look at those three designs in turn. Um, Blanc's design is called Liberty, Equality, and Fraternity. Um, although, although we translate the French Fraternité as fraternity, it's really more like brotherhood is a better term for that. And so here is a representation of France, of liberty, holding the scales of justice uh, in her one hand and the mirror of truth in the other hand. So these stamps were engraved in wood by Emile Thomas and are generally referred to as type Blanc. And neither of those two artists ever worked on another French stamp, again, for whatever reason. <clears throat> so the issued stamp uh, for use in France, one of those denominations is shown there at the bottom center. And you can see in this enlargement that the R is actually engraved upside down. This was an error by Thomas that apparently wasn't caught until later in the process and it was never fixed. Uh, the die was never re-engraved. On the right, you see a stamp for use in Algeria. So continuing what had started late in the Saj era, the French stamps were uh, designs were used in French, French colonies, which is the term we use for French controlled 
areas um, or in French post offices in far countries. This one was overprinted for use in Algeria. Some of the stamps had actual design changes to indicate where they were used. And I'll show you an example of that in uh, the next uh, design that we talk about. So here's a couple of usages. Um, you don't see too many um, solo usages, except for the five centime, which was the highest value initially issued, uh, which paid the rate for a domestic postcard that had five words or less. There was a cutoff there, a postcard with more than five words cost more postage. So here's a card and it's, um, the message is kisses from your love and the person's name, five words right there. The other way you see the Blanc design on regular letter mail is as a makeup value. In the case of the cover on the right, um, it makes up the last five centimes of a franking of one franc 95. There is, um, there is one postal stationary envelope with the five centime on it. It was not an envelope for a regular sized letter uh, because that would have cost more. But uh, popular at that time in France was visiting cards, something like the way we use business cards today in roughly the same size. And those had a special rate when they were mailed in an envelope of five centimes at that period of time. And so there was a postal stationary envelope with that design. And on the right is a newspaper wrapper, which is more for um, what the Blanc design was used for with the low values, printed matter and newspapers. Um, four of the five Blanc designs were printed on newspaper wrappers. The Blanc series was one, two, three, four, and five centimes, and all but the four centime were printed on wrappers. So uh, commemorations, there were two commemorations of the Blanc design. Uh, in 1964, there was a stamp on stamp design for it. Uh, one of the two stamps at the left and the um, Mouchon design that we're going to talk about in a minute was also uh, commemorated at the same time on uh, the right hand side. And then in 1998, there was a booklet issued for Stamp Day. The booklet has a pane of seven stamps plus a label. This is the top half of the pane. You see two varieties of the actual stamp. One is just three francs. The other is three francs plus 60 centimes uh, semi-postal. And then at top right is just a label with an enhanced or expanded bit of the Blanc design. <clears throat> okay, we'll move on to Mouchon's design, which is called the Rights of Man. He had the allegory of France holding the tablet which states rights of man in her left hand and the scepter of justice in her right. And there is, if you look carefully, a little lion's head sticking out of her bra, symbolized, symbolizing defiance um, or the ability to protect herself if necessary. So these were known as Titan Mouchon. They were in, he engraved his own design in a steel die um, this is the only stamp that he designed, although he had been a long time engraver and continued to engrave stamps after this for a while until he retired. Um, so five values of this stamp were issued. Unfortunately, that design came in for very heavy criticism. A little bit on the cynical side, some thought that the woman looked like people, like women who would hang out in an apartment and solicit men visitors. And they would have, let's say, a different idea of the rights of man than would, were really intended to be expressed. Um, a more serious criticism was 
that this was a period when women were advocating for equal rights and the right to vote, which in France they did not get until 1947. Um, although this sentiment had been existing since the time the rights of man were first promulgated in France during the French Revolution. And there was an artistic problem that, uh, or, or complaint that that value tablet in the upper right hand corner was just ugly. So Mouchon on his own couldn't do much about the overall design, but he did redraw that design. He changed the value tablet to be a little nicer shield, a little bit smaller, and he cleaned up the design. And those five values were replaced with the redrawn version in 1902. However, that wasn't considered enough. And in fact, all of those five stamps were replaced with a totally new design the next year, the design called the sewer, which we will talk about. However, as with the other stamps of this era, there were versions for use overseas. Um, on the right, there's one where the banner at the bottom was changed to be uh, Morocco and at the top was changed to be post Francaise. <clears throat> the original version of that stamp was issued with French currency, but later it was required by the EPU that stamps in foreign locations be in local currency. And so this one was surcharged to be in uh, the currency in use in Morocco. There, were, uh, there was a second commemoration for the Michonne design. Uh, the first one was the stamp on stamp that I showed a few minutes ago. And this was another stamp day booklet in a similar format to the one for the Blanc design. I think it's interesting that they said Mouchon 1902 referring to his redrawn stamp and not to his original stamp, which was in 1900. I thought this was interesting to show. This is a currency, piece of currency from the French Revolution. You can see the date at the top of 1793. And at the bottom, you see both the woman holding the rights of man and a woman holding the scales of justice. So um, these are obviously similar to the stamp designs that we just talked about. Or I should say the stamp designs were similar to these, which predated them. So neither Blanc nor Mouchon had uh, a, a, an original design, or maybe I should say that they just took themes that had existed in France for a hundred plus years and use that for their stamps. The third 1900 stamp is what we call the Liberty and Peace design. Um, this was designed by uh, Merson, and he called it the Seated Republic Guardian of the Peace. The Republic sits there to one side looking actually kind of bored, I think. Um, but ready to defend herself, she's wearing chain mail and she has a dagger in her left hand. This stamp has a number of almost firsts, the way I call it. Um, this was almost the first large size stamp for France. There was one other preceding it, issued in 1868. It was a five franc stamp with the portrait, of course, of Napoleon III. There wasn't much use for five franc stamps, and it was probably or almost certainly just an ego trip for Napoleon III to have him on a high value stamp like that. Also, that stamp was technically in two colors because the denomination and the currency symbol were at least in some printings in a slightly different color than the uh, stamp itself. The stamp was a bluish gray and the denomination was in a sort of dark blue color. Here, however, first of all, we have large stamps that were designed for everyday use. Second of all, we have two real colors, uh, generally contrasting colors. Since this was um, 
Silver Sprint did two dies were required, and they were engraved by Georges Auguste Thevenin. One die, of course, for the main design and the other for the background. It is interesting, though, that in the background color was only applied to the center of the stamp, even though there are bits of background at the upper right and upper left hand corner. Similarly to the Blanc design, neither of those two artists ever worked on any other French stamps. <clears throat> so of the three designs, this one is, I think, philatelically the most interesting. The Mouchon design, at least in uh, France itself, was discontinued in 1903. The Blanc design was low values and appeared mostly on printed matter or as makeup rates, as I discussed. But the Liberty, Liberty and Peace series had a large number of uses over its lifetime because rates changed down in 1906, which we'll talk about. And then a lot of series of increases during and especially after World War I. So there are a lot of usages for these stamps in its early lifetime for heavy mail, for registered or insured mail, and so on and so forth. And later as rates increased, the, some of these stamps were used, they paid just the letter rate or the postcard rate. What I've shown here is a couple of varieties. The two stamps on the left are overprinted for uh, training stamps to invalidate them. Uh, the first overprint was the French word annulé, which effectively means canceled. Then that was changed to specimen, a word which is spelled the same in French as it is in English, although the French pronunciation is obviously different. And on the right is a pre-cancel, which was done when 45 centimes paid a, um, a postcard rate. And um, the standard prehensile design that was adopted by France and was in use for many decades after that was a half of a double circle with the word affranchissement abbreviated in it. That word essentially means postage or franking. And then the word posts. Um, that generally appeared on regular sized definitives, but it was on this one um, as well, <clears throat> when during uh, a period of its use. So here's one usage of this design on a registered envelope to Liberty and Peace stamps uh, from a business in the French town of Douai sent to a business in Finland. I happen to have a friend in Finland who was able to translate a little bit and told me that P-U-U, and I haven't the foggiest idea how to pronounce it, means wood and that this was actually a timber company in Helsinki. So then I did a little research on the sending company, Bronier, and discovered that in as late as 2003, there was a company in Douai called Branier Godfrin, presumably a descendant of the company back in 1921 when this letter was mailed, and still in the wood business. So it's, I find it kind of interesting when I can bring some things up to date a little bit and, and relate an older cover to something today. An interesting feature of this cover is you'll notice that the 45 centime stamp on the left is on a dark, relatively dark brown paper, almost the same color as the envelope. This was done intentionally, and this kind of paper, a dark colored paper, is called GC paper for the French words grand consommation or large usage. And they reflect the fact that during World War I and for a few years after that, it was very hard to get white or near white paper. So the French used a darker paper and printed the current stamps on it until paper supplies approved. And this was intentional. And in fact, these stamps, when they were printed, 
there were the large letters GC that appeared at one spot in the margin of each post office pane of stamps. These are listed by Scott given minor numbers. This particular one is 122B. Usually there's a slight premium over the value of the stamp printed on the white paper, but not a drastic premium for it. So you won't find any real rarities with GC paper, but it is an interesting and intentional um, variant. Here are two examples of stamps used outside of France. Uh, the left one was overprinted and surcharged for use in Silesia, which was a part of Turkey that the French administered after World War I. The stamp on the right was redesigned. The text was revised for use in Alexandria, Egypt. This version was still had the French currency of two francs. Later stamps had Egyptian currency on them instead. Now, I would love to talk about commemorations of this stamp, but none exist. For some reason, the French post office commemorated, as you saw, the size design, the other two uh, designs from 1900, even the Mouchon design, which was roundly uh, disapproved of. And, but there has been no commemoration at all of this design, and I don't really expect to see one. So I mentioned, uh, I think, that all three of these designs were pretty much frowned upon, Mouchon's especially, but the other two were not really popular. So as was typical of the time, people drew caricatures, and I found three of these in one of the journals. The Sage design over on the left with Liberty holding some kind of a puppet rather than the scales. The cherubs being, I think, a little more enthusiastic. And the uh, thing that she's sitting on has been turned into a clock. In the center is a spoof of Merson's design where um, the representative of France has been turned into a commoner, perhaps that's a wash woman with a basket, a wash basket um, next to her. And the shield containing the denomination has been turned into, looks like some sort of teacup. And on the right, the woman holding the rights of man is crying and a gentleman says, what have you to cry about? And she says, oh, the crooks, they stole my man. And she's referring to the type Saj design, which is not very subtly pictured at the bottom of that cartoon. And the fact that the woman in that design had a man next to her, but now she's all alone with that tablet. So as a result of all of that, the post office said, well, we better have a new design. And the minister of posts, Alexandra Barard, decided to use an existing design that was done by a sculptor, Louis Oscar Roti, called the sower. He first did it for a medal for the Department of Agriculture or the Minister of Agriculture. And then it was adopted for use on French coins starting in 1897. So the public was already familiar with this design and it was a pretty safe bet, I think, for stamps. And there was both a literal and figurative symbolism to this. Literally, she's sowing seeds, and this helps to feed French. But in a symbolic sense, she's sowing ideas against the prevailing winds. You can see that the wind is blowing towards her face, but she's tossing the seeds out in front of herself. And this was, again, a contrast with France's eastern neighbor, that France stood for peace rather than militarism and war. <clears throat> so Roti actually did a design for the stamp on a plaster cast, um, including the sewer and the lettering and horizontal lines that he felt emphasized the sewer better. And based on that, Mouchon engraved the design, this time using copper. The first five values of sewers 
actually were the mid-range values that replaced Mouchon's design. So it must have been at least a little bit of a humbling experience to have to be the engraver of the design that replaced his own design. But nonetheless, he did that. Also, I show there one of Germany's stamps at the time, which is Germania, and you can see the striking difference between the two. And on the bottom, I repeat one of the positive quotes from a Paris newspaper, which talked about the noble, exquisite figure, which is an artistic value, giving us the ideal model, delicious and symbolic. I'm sure not all the opinions of the stamp were so effusive, but the fact that this made it into a newspaper was an indication of a much more positive uh, reception than the previous three designs. Well, almost. There were still quibbles. People quibbled with the fact that those horizontal lines made it difficult to see, especially the text and the denomination on the stamp. So Mouchon started working on additional designs, although there wasn't any feeling of rush about it. And then that situation changed. In the middle 1900s and, and the middle of that first century, uh, first decade, uh, citizens started complaining. All the other Western countries had letter rates, which were roughly the equivalent of France's 10 centimes. But the letter rate in France was stubbornly kept at 15 centimes. So there was a public campaign. And finally, the post office uh, bowed to that and decided they would cut the rate to 10 centimes. And Berard wanted a new, or at least a new variation of the design. So they took one of the designs that Mouchon had been working on, which is the silver without the lined background, but standing on a piece of ground. And that was used for the first 10 centimes stamp that you see there on the left. That the Unlined sewer, which we refer to today as the cameo sewer, you may see that term in the literature, um, was standing on a piece of ground. And it, people said, no, that's not very good either. It looks like a pedestal. And we shouldn't be propping up a figure of, the, of a republic. So it was quickly removed and the stamp was reissued without the ground and no other stamps appeared with that design, but that is a very common stamp because it was used as the letter rate for uh, a period of time. And there's one other difference of that design. If you notice um, on the first design, there's a little bit of the seed bag protruding out in front of the sower's left arm. It is gone in the revised stamp. That's because Berard thought it looked a little bit like the sower's breast and he wanted that removed. Now that was present on the lined design as well, but perhaps it just wasn't as noticeable because of all those horizontal lines. So all the cameo sowers have that little bit of the seed bag removed from it, uh, from the design. The horizontal lined sewers were in fact retired shortly after 1906 when they were all replaced by cameo sewers, but they were reintroduced in the 1920s when rates were changing very quickly. And I suspect they either needed to press into use some design dyes that they had earlier with new denominations, or they just wanted to have enough design differentiated between those with lines and those without. So here are some varieties. The sewer design was used for France's two semi-postals, first semi-postals. The first one is shown here, which was an overprint of plus five centimes with the Red Cross, who is the recipient of the uh, donation. Uh, the Red Cross was used as the plus sign, which I thought was pretty clever. Um, the second version actually had the plus five centime uh, into the design, a modified design. Both of those stamps are fairly common. We have a surcharge stamp 
it was French practice never to waste any stamps. And if they had a large quantity of stamps that were no longer useful because postage rates had changed, they just surcharged it to a different useful value. And the surcharge almost always was a lower value than the original face value of the stamp because it was felt that if the surcharge was higher, that would encourage forgeries of it, people who would buy at the old rate and sell it at the revised rate. So they were very careful to always surcharge downward, although there may have been one or two exceptions. Foreign use, again, here's an, another example from Silesia. And um, this one is printed on the darker GC paper. And finally, there are some stamps you will see with the overprint in French, caisse d'amortissement. That's the French word for sinking fund, which is a term which reflects a government fund set up to help pay down war debt. We don't see that term used very much now. Uh, but anyway, France decided that they were going to offer stamps where customers could pay a little bit extra and help the government pay down its debt. These were not very popular over time. But what's interesting philatelically about these stamps is even though it looks like an overprint, it is not really. That lined light green 50 cent sewer was never issued as a regular stamp. That color was specifically chosen for this stamp and both the light green and the dark blue printing were printed in one pass through a two cylinder rotary press. So technically it is not an overprint, it is a two color stamp. A couple of usages on the left is a cover where um, in 1917, apparently there was a shortage of postage due stamps, at least in that small town um, in, uh, on the southern coast of France. And so they pressed into use a five centime sewer, which is overprinted with the upside down triangle tax mark. And on the right is an example of something that was very popular around that time, which we call a stamp collar, uh, in French, a port timbre. And um, these were used for advertising. These were used for political slogans and other purposes. And here we have a sl political slogans from the anti-alcohol crusade. And the text around the stamp starting from the top reads, War on alcohol, alcohol makes you stupid, absinthe makes you crazy. Absinthe is a alcoholic drink that was popular at the time, apparently rather strong alcoholic drink. And finally, alcohol kills. So not a very subtle way of giving out the message at all. A couple of stationary items, the 15 centime envelope, when the rate was reduced to 10 centimes, it was uh, overprinted. Uh, the French says tax reduced uh, to zero franc 10 centimes. And on the right is a 15 centime postcard, which is uprated with another 15 centimes. Uh, it is written in German and sent to Berlin. The sewer is the only design from this time period, which was actually reissued for everyday use rather than in just a commemorative type format. In 1960, French, the French revalued the franc and the so-called new francs were worth 100 of the old francs. So, denomination, what used to be 20 francs was now 20 centimes. And so to help with the transition and the demand for new stamps, uh, a two color recess printed sewer was issued, the one on the right. And then a year later, a 30 centime stamp was issued uh, on the left. And this is two first day covers that I'm showing here. And after that, the sewer was retired from everyday use 
but there were still, of course, commemorations. Here's one of the stamp day booklets, similar to the other two that I showed earlier, uh, with the sewer design and one label in the pane, and what I think is a nicely attractive cover to the booklet. In 2014, there was another commemoration with a sewer reprint, and I think this reflects uh, the current French post office's tendency to issue stamps for collector on rather flimsy uh, rationale. So in 2011, the French did introduce a new uh, class of letters for letter rate, which they called and is still called green letters, meaning economically friendly um, transportation, which in effect means surface mail rather than air mail. So typically, if you were sending a letter from Paris to Marseille by priority, which is equivalent to first class mail, that would go by air. But if you paid a slightly reduced rate for slightly slower service, it would go by surface transportation. And that's the green rate. So three years afterwards seemed to merit a whole miniature sheet on the subject. And the sower has a primary design on the sheet. One of the four stamps is the reprint of the sower, which I have shown enlarged here. Um, the other four stamps, the first one is Ceres, which is a reprint of the initial stamp design from 1849 and following on. Uh, then the sower, then uh, Marion of Europe, which was the current design for the first green letter stamp, and that's what's pictured here. And then Marianne and Youth, which was the current design in 2014, and that was the stamp for the green letter rate. <clears throat> so we move on from the sewers. The sewers were introduced in 1903. There wasn't a new design until 20 years later in 1923, when the Pasteur series was introduced. And this was a little bit different. The first three stamps, Scott notes and says that those were commemoratives. And indeed, they were intended to commemorate the centenary of Pasteur's birth, which would have been, would have been 1922, um, although they were delayed and didn't appear until May 1923. They were issued in the three denominations for foreign rates foreign printed matter, postcard, and letters. And the first three, which are not the three pictured here, were 10 cent, 30 cent, and 50 centime. And so they were in the UPU colors for those rates, green for printed matter, red for postcard, and blue for letters. So when they were issued, although they were a commemorative in nature, they did replace the sowers of the same value, which were discontinued at the time. So they were kind of really a combination of commemorative and regular issue. And then since this was the mid 1920s, the inflationary period, the um, stamps were, the Pasteur stamps were replaced every year for a few years, uh, I think through 1926, yes, um, with new higher rate stamps. And the older pastors were retired. And the retiring pastors, if the denomination was still needed for another reason, were replaced by sowers. So this explains part of the reason why there are so many sowers. There was a sower, it was discontinued for a pastor. Then sometimes that sower reappeared in a new color, making it a different stamp. Sometimes it was the older stamp that was just brought back for printing again. Uh, these stamps were designed and engraved by Georges Henri Prudhomme, who had created a medal with a very similar design. And um, it's worth noting that Pasteur was the second real person to appear on a French stamp after Napoleon III. And of course, the first uh, person who wasn't a ruler of 
the French state. Here are a couple of examples of um, varieties of Pasteur. Um, surcharge stamp to use up an obsolete value, uh, a stamp for test d'amortissement, and for the Pasteur designs, they just used CA, I presume, so that the portrait would not be defaced by the long words that were used on the seller. And then uh, a value for use uh, in a foreign territory, this one for an area of Syria that was under French mandate after World War I. And uh, a usage on the left in combination with a sewer stamp and a postal card with the Pasteur design, um, a 20 centime that was used in 1926. Um, this stamp has never been reprinted with a commemoration or any of the few others that I'm going to discuss now. <clears throat> so we get to some stamps which you may not have considered to be definitives if you collect the France of this period, but they certainly were. They replaced um, Sower and Merson designs and they were designed to encourage tourism. And so they were uh, large size pictorial stamps and they were recess printed. Um, they were again, almost first. There was one other recess printed stamp issued in 1928. And then these came along starting in 1929. Um, these were the first stamps that were printed by cylindrical plates rather than flat plates, which were used for the 1928 stamps. So these continued in use until the late 1930s. There were a number of different ones. And we get back to regular um, definitive size. And this in design was introduced in 1932, often called simply Peace. Um, French wanted to simplify things a little bit, and they were going to, um, except for some of those high value pictorial designs, they were just going to have two designs, the sewer design for lower values and the piece design for higher values up to two francs. And the designer, um, Paul Albert Laurent, uh, called this the will to peace. It was engraved by Antonin Delzier and issued, as I said, in 1932. It's often referred to as just peace, sometimes peace of Lorenz or the French equivalent, uh, Pay de Long. And uh, these stamps also had, or I show some usages first. Um, this is on a envelope sized for carte de visite. It's not a postal stationary envelope, it is franked with stamps. There was no discounted rate for these for international mail. This one went to Geneva, Switzerland, so it paid the full letter rate, which at the time was one franc 50. And there's a picture of postal card from 1936 um, <clears throat> uh, with a 40 centime stamp. And as I believe we have discussed uh, informally in the past, a lot of postcards of this era, at least in France, had the stamp on the front side of it, not on the address side. By this time in 1932, the French designs were no longer used for post offices outside France. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, uh, there are no um, overprints or surcharges or revised designs for external uh, locations. What we do have is stamps overprinted with FM for Franchise Militaire, um, not new to this design. These were stamps that were given out for free to uh, members of the military to use in letters uh, that they wanted to write. So this did start with the Mouchon design and continued into the sewer design 
and ended up with the piece design. Scott assigns these a prefix of M, and this is the final one, which is M9. And then there are some surcharges of this stamp. Most of them occurred after the war started, um, but a few of the obsolete values were overprinted before the war. Uh, this one from 1934. Excuse me for a second. I'm losing my voice. Okay, <clears throat> and finally, we'll wrap up with three new designs that were introduced just before World War II. Again, the government was deciding to uh, change their stamp designs. The piece design was not really popular, and by 1938, it was pretty clear there wasn't going to be peace in Europe for a long time. And the sewer design was getting a little long in the tooth. There was some effort to modify the sewer design, uh, bring it up to date, but uh, that was not ever accepted. So instead they went back to the classics of picking um, the ancient gods. Uh, there on the left is uh, Mercury, the Roman messenger god. In the center is Iris, uh, the Greek messenger god. And then on the right is Ceres, uh, who was on the original French stamps, as I showed briefly earlier. And um, they decided to kind of reprint that a little bit updated design and certainly with a more legible uh, value in the lower corners. Uh, so the two on the left were designed and engraved on wood by Georges Ouillet. Um, who designed and engraved a um, number of stamps for France and the French colonies. A series was done by the printer and they didn't uh, uh, give any uh, specific person or persons who worked on the stamp. So I'm not going to talk very much about these because most of them were used uh, during and after the war. Uh, the Mercury design was actually reissued by the Vichy government with post Francaise, which was the uh, wording that they used rather because it was obviously no longer a republic. The other two designs were phased out as quickly as possible. Some of them were surcharged and a few stamps hung around and were actually used after the liberation in 1944. So that completes our survey of the stamps, definitive stamps of that time period. I wanted to share with you one reference that I found very useful and that you can acquire at no or low cost. There is a three volume set of books, thin books called The Regular Usage, I'm sorry, The Regular Issues of France According to Their Normal Postage Usage. Postal Usage by Stan Luft. It was published by the Friends and Colonies Philatelic Society in the US. So there's part of a page on the right and you can see what they have for every issue. This one for the 30 cent green Pasteur issue. It gives the issue date, the Scott number. It tells what stamp it replaced. It tells the usages of that stamp, a single usage. Um, of that stamp during its lifetime. Um, it tells what periods it was printed and some details of the printing. And then it tells what stamp replaced that stamp and when. So this is how I and you, if you get this book, um, can trace the usage, uh, the progression of the different stamps. It doesn't talk about things that I did, like why were they new stamps in 1900, but those you can find. This helps you really trace things and explain why there are so many different um, definitives throughout the period. So the three volumes, the first volume covers the period that I talked about um, and through World War II. Then two subsequent values go up to 1977. 
The first volume can be downloaded for free from the Society's website at the link that I show there. Um, it is on a page with a lot of downloads and is a supplement to number 156. And what all those downloads are on the page are every issue of the Journal of that Society up through 2016. So several hundred journals there. And if you really want to read about French stamps and are willing to do a little bit of downloading, that's a treasure trove. All three volumes of Luft's work are still in print and available from the Society at $5 each from the secretary, Jerry, at the enterprise, um, at the email address down below, plus a small charge for postage. So if you email Jerry and tell him which one or ones that you want, he will let you know what the total cost is with postage and how to remit payment and they're yours. So that wraps up our whirlwind tour. I hope you found it enjoyable and informative. And now I will be glad to answer any questions. So Paul, back to Thank you. you. Thank you very much. There are a couple of questions, Larry, on the chat box. Do you see those? Um, I will go now and do that. I think from Carl. <laughs> What was the purpose of the hexagonal cancellation on the Monaco stamp? I do not know. I can't even guess. Why did the Germans allow the French to make their own stamps and not use German stamps? The Germans wanted the French and the world to think that this was not really an occupation so much or that the French still retained some control. Um, and so they continued using French stamps. Um, at the beginning of the war, you may know that the Germans occupied the northern and western portion of France, namely all the portions that are adjacent to water and inland by several hundred miles. And the southeastern part of France was nominally still an independent country um, with a government headquartered in Vichy, and today we call that the Vichy uh, regime. But the leader of the Vichy regime, Marshal Pétain, Marshal is an honorific, not his first name, um, was very sympathetic to the Germans. And so there wasn't too much difference really between the occupied area and the Vichy controlled area. And in 1942, when the allies um, began to invade Africa on their way to um, opposing the Germans in Europe, the Germans occupied the whole area, but they left Patan in as a figurehead. And uh, they were still trying to uh, make the impression that France was some sort of nominally self-governed state. And so there were French stamps. There were even stamps issued for the French colonies, although a lot of them were never ever used at a French colony. So that's kind of the history of why that was true. Any other questions? Larry, I have one. Uh, you mentioned in 1906, there was a uh, rate increase because of popular demand. Are these the same French people I've known and loved who uh, wanted a raise hike? Or? The, 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 rate, uh, the rates were decreased in 1906. Okay. Um, the same French people, well, I guess they were the French people of 1906. Uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure what you it's a, it, it just said there was a by popular demand there was a rate hike so they, no, they it wasn't a hike it was a decrease okay, okay. The, the demand was to cut the rate from 15 centimes for a letter to 10 centimes. yeah that's that sounds more like it thank you yeah that's more like it right I don't know any time that any people really demanded a rate increase but they certainly suffered a number of them yep especially during the inflationary period. 
Okay. Other questions, people? Yeah, I, I have yeah. one. Uh, it, it was a, a great presentation, Larry. Many, many thanks. Yeah. Uh, I, the type Sage uh, stamps, the imperforates. Uh, Scott lists uh, the imperforates uh, also under uh, France, uh, also, but it then underneath them, it says, uh, beware of French colonies, numbers 24 to 29. And there's no information on how you distinguish between the ones that were supposedly uh, available in France versus the ones that were used in the French colonies. Well, I think the ones available in France were errors, imperfect errors. There was never an intentionally imperfect version of those stamps issued in France. And as far as I know, the only way you can tell is if it's a used stamp and you can identify where the cancel was. This, um, there are many experts in French stamps who can do that, it requires studying all the cancels, being able to distinguish a part of a cancel when the stamp has been soaked off the envelope and so on and so forth. So I think that's what there were some error copies, um, imperfect errors that got out into France and distinguishing them is very hard. So I think if you can identify, you must assume that it's the more common French colonies version that you have and certainly a mint copy. Now, not every size stamp was issued for colonies. So if there's one that was not issued for colonies, then it's an imperfect error. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Larry. Other comments, questions? Well, Larry, we appreciate it. Very well done. You did not miss a beat. <laughs> I don't know how you did that. That's more information that I've seen come through clearly yeah, and thank soundly thank uh, for a long time. So we, we do appreciate that. And uh, you're always available for people who have questions on the area. So we'll certainly keep that in mind.